Hey guys, welcome to another video in my channel. My name is Sebastian Cavazzoli and in this video I'm going to show you the pipeline for creating a character or an asset for games. This is going to be the character we're creating today. For this one I started different from what I usually do. I always start blocking in Blender and then I send it up to ZBrush. But this time, as it was gonna be only a bust, I decided to see how it goes directly in ZBrush. So I kinda skipped the blocking phase and started directly with the sculpt. As you can see, I got that skeleton reference for the head. I got that from a video by a guy named Folygon. I mean, his nickname is Folygon. He has his own channel and I highly recommend you check him out. So his channel is gonna be on this video's description if you're interested. So I've put the reference image, the concept art, using the spotlight tool in ZBrush. But then I put all the references onto a pure ref file and I used that on the second monitor. I really recommend you to use pure ref or any way you can get all the references visible. Just work with reference. It's really, really important and, and it changes a lot the your end result. By the way, this concept art was done by Lucia Masuko. She's a nice friend of mine and hell, she creates such a nice art. <laughs> you should go ahead and check out her portfolio too. She didn't only create the concepts I used as reference, but she also gave me art direction and feedback and it really helped me out a lot. This is a question I'm always asked by people in the comments or by message. Like, do you animate your characters or are the characters you make for animation or printing or even games? Or what do you do with the characters after? And yeah, things like that. So almost all my characters just finish in sculpt and I go ahead and render with procedural shaders and they are left there. No printing, no games, no animation. Although I work full time in a company and we create assets for games, so there I have a bunch of stuff I created for games with the whole pipeline. You haven't seen the stuff in my portfolio because I'm not allowed to show that yet, but soon I will. <laughs> so with this character I tried to do a similar pipeline to show you guys how it would be to get this character from sculpt to an asset that could be used in games. For animation I've never done and neither for printing, but yeah, it's different. If you want to create a character for animation, you have to have some stuff in mind. The same goes for printing and the same goes for games. For example, if you're creating an asset that you know is going to end up in a game, you need to be thinking on the next steps. When you're sculpting, you should be thinking on the topology, I mean, by closing all the holes you can see or not leaving any messy areas that can make your topology more complicated or even simplifying stuff to be able to lower down the poly count. Always thinking on the next step. Because you always get a maximum poly count for every asset and no matter what, you can't get past that number. Of course, for this character I hadn't any, but I tried to not abuse of this. <laughs> Just like that, when you're working on your topology, you should be thinking about UVs and bakes what stuff you merge together, what parts to keep separate, to make it easier later on the baking process. When you're working on your UVs, you can be thinking about where do you make your cuts so that you get nice UV islands so that when you're painting on Substance Painter you can get that nice masking by UV islands. You can also rectify a part of the mesh on the UV, I mean, so that you get a squared or rectangular UV island and that is really handy because because you're saving space because the pixels you're using are all squared and are and are not getting jagged and also if you paint a line across the whole uv island you will get a line going around the whole mesh of course all of this stuff i'm mentioning right now we are not gonna see it in depth in this video this video is just to get an overview of the whole process it's all sped up, so it, it will be really difficult to show you what I'm talking about. So yeah, I'm gonna talk about a little about the sculpting I'm, I'm doing here. Here I'm adding some new objects. She has some metals above her clothes. Using the C Modeler tool for, for this, 
and then once I've modeled it straight I try to make it fit to the curvature of the sculpt. Then I move on to the hair. This part was really hard. I've got a lot of parts that <laughs> I start all over again with the hair so that you don't get messed up with a super long video and yeah I just left the one that got right <laughs> but if I have to say a part in a specific part where I uh, come and go a lot the most for this video for this character uh, definitely is gonna be the hair because it was the most difficult part for me okay so now I start painting the model uh, some basic colors only so that I can get a nice reference of what it's gonna be um, it's gonna be looking like and I start working on this piece she has on the on the top of her head over her hair I haven't touched it yet so yeah it was time to work over it I try to keep it simple I'm adding some stuff on with working with C modeler and creases and then I add the the hairs that are gonna be sticking out this this piece and I just make some quick sculpting here didn't give much importance to this part although every part in the model is important unless it's not gonna be seen like I don't know the mouth the the inside of the mouth of this character she isn't gonna open her mouth at any time so I didn't sculpt it so for the gem she has there I just got a cube I start trimming pieces out to get that gemstone effect and yeah then I just sculpt it a little bit more so this is it for the sculpting phase you can see here I have a base with some vegetation I didn't record that so yeah sorry <laughs> after the sculpting is done I move on to Maya to get the model into Maya before I decimate it in ZBrush with the decimation tool decimation master I think it's called and yeah then I get it into Maya I start naming this so that I have the scene organized and I start with the topology I'll go one by one I mean I get one object I hide all the rest and I focus only on that object I start using the quad draw tool it's really simple to use you just start extruding and extruding and extruding <laughs> and moving vertices of course I've got some parts here also so that the video doesn't get so long I think I worked the whole topology you, uh, you listen to podcasts and videos in YouTube and no music I don't know what you guys prefer when you're working to remain in silence or to listen to music or to, to some people speaking so for the leaves I tried to make the sculpt uh, like all the same so that the topology was all the same for all of them I created the topology for one leaf and then I duplicated and put it into place for the others and for the UVs I could stack them out and use only one leaf as for the UV so that I didn't occupy the more space on the UV space and then in Marmoset I would only bake one leaf and also in Substance I would only paint one leaf so it's a little bit less work and more UV space for, for later okay then I start with the topology for the face this was the hardest one for topology uh, I'm not as you know I'm not a any expert on topology the faces are still difficult to me so I try to make the the most important loops first and then try to connect everything although this character wasn't gonna be animated I tried to get a, a clean a nice topology so yeah this topology step can be really tedious but I think it's a nice moment to <laughs> to reflect about things <laughs> uh, but yeah it's really boring but sometimes it's uh, it relieves stress <laughs> it was really long and the hair here was also uh, hard to me but once it's done once you're done with the whole topology of the character or the asset you're working on it gives you a, a really nice sensation <laughs> I mean you you see the 
the whole character and you see the, the worst, let's say the worst part already done. So you know the next step is painting and baking and okay baking I think it's worse <laughs> I think it's worse than topology but also when you're finished with baking it gives you that nice sensation again that nice feeling I think every step you you finish you get a nice feeling right but when you finish steps that are hard for you or are tedious for you in everything I mean not only 3d art it gives you a nice feeling right Something I do sometimes with topology is starting really really low and then I have to add some more some more polygons there or I start really really high and I have to delete some polygons. I think it's easier when you have to delete some polygons later than when you have to add some polygons. So definitely I think you should go for the best looking version of your asset and meaning in speaking about topology and then if you see you have a high poly count and you need to go uh, some steps down it's easier that way and it will definitely look better so I'm sure you guys are gonna ask me in the comments why didn't I choose blender for the uh, for the retopology instead of Maya and that's just simply because uh, I prefer Maya using the quadro to to do this process instead of Blender. Uh, yeah, I just find Maya more more useful to me in this in this step. And I think we should never marry a single program, a single software, just because we like it and assume all the other programs are shitty. <laughs> and if you know me a little bit, I'm sure you know I don't really like Maya, and that's true. I don't like Maya at all and I don't like uh, 3D Max at all <laughs> but to be honest I, I think Maya's way of working with retopology is much better than Blender at least for now right? so yeah never marry a single software and, and try to find the fastest and best way you can reach out to, to what you're looking for and now it's time to go ahead with the UVs Believe it or not, I like working on the UVs. After the topology is done, I think it's a a nice step. It's really relaxing for me. I don't know why, <laughs> but I really like it. So for the UVs here, I worked with UV Layout, that is another software, and it can work as an application and as an add-on for Maya. I really like using it. You can you have a lot of of control over your UVs and it's really easy to use although the workflow and this software uh, I mean the the key shortcuts you know the shortcuts are really different from all the other softwares I've ever used like you have uh, shortcuts that are all the way across the keyboard and it's really uncomfortable to use but once you get used to it, it it's cool so this is what the UVs look like, I separated it into two UVs, so two materials, so that in substance I could hide some stuff and not work with the whole model. For the baking I set the edges, I set the edges of the model to be all soft and then I hardened the edges of the UVs, of the UV cuts, sorry, of the UV seams. <laughs> And then I smooth the the edges that shouldn't be hard, like for example the those parts you saw on the mushrooms. So for the baking, I think I should make a whole separate video on this subject because yeah, it's a really long subject. <laughs> but yeah, roughly what I did was import the whole model and separate each piece into baking groups. So that they are not touching for the for when I bake the ambient occlusion, and some parts uh, I move them around so that yeah for the ambient occlusion they are not uh, generating upward stuff. You can see in some parts. So yeah, I try to separate them, but not so long so that they uh, 
emit that occlusion to the other part. <laughs> I know it's really hard talking about this without actually doing it right in, in real time. The ambient occlusion I would say is the most difficult part to bake and then the rest it's pretty straightforward. One thing I forgot to do when I finished the sculpt was to create some gradients in ZBrush with the poly paint using the mask. And yeah, once I realized that, <laughs> I created it and then I export the whole high poly again to Marmoset for the baking so that I bake the gradients, these gradients, into the vertex paint. So those gradients are, uh, I'll, I'll use them afterwards in, in Substance Painter to create some, some cool overlay effects. I bake the normals, of course, <laughs> also the normals on the object space. I bake the position, that is a generated gradient, just in case. I bake the curvature, that is really nice and handy to use in the substance. I bake the thickness so that we can have that subsurface scattering stuff and translucency. I bake, of course, the ambient occlusion and I bake the vertex color. Once I have all the bakes done, it should look like this. To export it into Marmoset, I used all the parts separate, all the parts I could separate to get big groups, but for substance I just needed to separate it into the two materials I have. So I exported it and then I realized I didn't create the materials, so I just go ahead and create them and export it again. Once I'm into Substance, I import all the resources, all the textures we've baked in Marmoset. And one important thing I do here, as you can see the normal map is all messed up. You should change the format from DirectX, DirectX <laughs> to OpenGL and it will work nicely. And then I start creating the materials. So I start with the skin, I set a roughly selected color <laughs> for, the, for the skin because yeah at this point at the beginning I only want to separate the all the materials and then I start working on them. So I only get an approximate of the color I want to use and then I move on to another material. Working in substance is working a lot with, with masks so yeah everything you do you create a mask for it. For example to paint everything I paint I create a new fill layer and I create a black mask for this uh, fill layer and then over that mask I paint the only the parts that I want to be affected by this fill layer. So I create this subsurface scattering effect for the skin of the character and the leaves. This subsurface scattering effect for Substance Painter I learned it while I was creating it really. And yeah I continue throwing materials throwing down materials and painting the masks for every material. This is where the UV islands that we create come in handy also for throwing materials and clicking, only clicking to create the mask on all that area and not having to paint it out. One thing is really important to say here about this software, this amazing software, is that when you paint Everything you paint in 3D, I mean, I, as I'm painting right here on the 3D mesh and not using the UV you can use in Substance, painting in 2D. Uh, the, the good thing about painting in 3D is that any changes you make to your, to your UV later, for example, let's say you realize that some stuff in the UV could be uh, different, if you change your UV, and you re-import this mesh, the same mesh, all the things you painted before it will be automatically corrected by the software uh, because you painted in 3D. So it will be projected to your new mesh and you won't have to paint again. If you paint in 2D, this won't happen. So once you're done with your substance scene, you've painted the whole model and you're satisfied with that, you can export it and import it into a into a game engine such as Unreal Engine or Unity. You can also import it into Marmoset Viewer and you have that nice real-time renderer. You can export this uh, file from Marmoset to a Marmoset Viewer file and you can 
upload that into your art station or any website you can use as your portfolio. It's a nice alternative for a you know, for a game engine, right? And why not? You can also import it into Blender. You can load your textures and hit that render. And there you have it. Using EV. So guys, this is it for today's video. I hope you've enjoyed it. And if you liked it, please give it a thumbs up or leave your comment below. If you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, just go ahead and click that subscribe button below. And see you guys on the next one.